I think we're going to an industry in which Apple and Spotify are, are selling big advertisers and fulfilling ad spots on hundreds of thousands of podcasts at once, you know? Like, it should be that easy on publish, and it should be the platforms that are doing this. Obviously, you're still going to make more, more money if you go out and do deals on your own, but for those just starting out and want to make a little bit of money, the solutions right now are so ad hoc. I know everybody's saying podcasts are early, but it's just crazy to me that we don't have the basics of advertising on different platforms where you can just turn it on with the click of a button like you can on YouTube. We stand today. The Business Method. The business with method. a shadow. The Business Method. The Business Method Podcast. The Business Method Podcast featuring Chris Reynolds. Entrepreneurs, systems, methods, tools, and tactics for location independence. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, I'm your host, Chris Reynolds, and welcome to the Business Method Podcast, a podcast featuring successful entrepreneurs and high-profile people dissecting their business models. We dissect the different methods, tools, and tactics of high-performance online entrepreneurs and high-caliber people in a series format. On our first series, we interviewed 100 entrepreneurs in 100 days that have built businesses creating $100,000 or more annually. On our second series, we interviewed 100 entrepreneurs that have built location-independent businesses that produce over a million dollars and annual revenue and now we're interviewing 100 major influencers to get behind the minds and the science of using influence to grow business and influence income results economies and cultures there's a growing number of people building these caliber of businesses like this and we're going to figure out what it takes to make this happen now let's jump in today's show the business method Hey listeners, I got the exciting opportunity to hop on the mic with the founder and the host of The Pitch Podcast, Josh Muccio. The Pitch is one of the top podcasts out there today on business and entrepreneurship. The Pitch features entrepreneurs in need of funding and they get to pitch a panel of investors live on the show. Very much like Shark Tank, but it is a real show where entrepreneurs pitch real investors for real money. We got to talk with Josh for well over an hour about how he started the pitch and kept growing it even after having 55 shows with zero investments. Finally, he got the first investment on the show and everything changed from that moment on. Not too long after Gimlet Media acquired Josh's podcast, this has changed everything for Josh as a professional podcaster and creative entrepreneur. Now, the pitch has been named the best business podcast on Startup Life by Fortune Magazine and it is one of the top rated business podcasts in the world. On the show today, we chat with Josh about how he got to start as an entrepreneur and podcaster, his first failing podcast and the idea to create the pitch. We talk a lot about what is making podcasts successful today, share some methods of what works when building a successful podcast, and where we think the podcast world is headed in the next few years. And we also touch a bit on influence and how Josh manages his influence as a top podcaster. So before we jump into the show, we've got to tell you really quick about an upcoming event we have, Get Shit Done Live in Chiang Mai, Thailand. It is 10 days of high performance productivity, collaboration, accountability, targeted execution with other established entrepreneurs where people escape from their normal routine and go to get a lot of work done in a little amount of time. If you got a project you want to finish before the end of the year, what we do is we set goals that can move the needle in your business and we have daily check-ins twice a day in small groups to hold you accountable and it's a lot of fun. People say it's like six months of work in 10 days. One attendee from last year literally created $170,000 in sales from the last two days of event. It is an amazing high impact event. Check it out at thebusinessmethod.com forward slash events, thebusinessmethod.com forward slash events. It'll pop up and show you all the details. Now, without further ado, you guys, let's welcome Josh Muccio, the host and founder of The Pitch, one of today's top business and investing podcast in the world. Here we go. Entrepreneurs, systems, methods, tools, and tactics. Listeners, welcome to the podcast today. I'm incredibly excited to welcome Josh Muccio 
to the show. He is the founder and a host of the Pitch Podcast, one of the top business podcasts that are out. The show is featuring um, entrepreneurs in need of venture funding, and they pitch people live on the show. And Josh does an incredible job, Josh and his team, of putting this show together where they talk to these investors, pitching these entrepreneurs for money, and uh, then include some thoughts throughout the show in a really good listening style. So, Josh, I want to say thank you so much for coming to the Business Method Podcast. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. Thank you, Chris. It's uh, good to be here. Where in the world are you calling in from today? Sarasota, Florida. Sunny nice. Sarasota. Is that where you're based at? Yep. Yep. I work here most of the time, and then we'll travel up to New York when we do uh, the big recording events. That's where all the entrepreneurs and investors come in for a couple of days and uh, record a bunch of pitches. Um, but the rest of the time, I'm working out of my fourth bedroom in my home, uh, which is where I'm at right now. Very cool. That's the way to do it. Work from home. Do you ever you, you ever get the urge to go to a co-working space or get an office oh, yourself? Yeah. Do you? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah. If I didn't have all of this uh, great podcasting equipment that keeps me here, and if I didn't have a show that I'm constantly uh, recording uh, narration for, it would be easier to get out. But. Um, you know, maybe, maybe next time. Cause sometimes I get the kids knocking on the door and they're like, Hey dad, you... I'm like, no, act like I'm not here. I'm busy. You need to sign I'm on, very busy. sign on the door. I, do not disturb. Right? I really do. You know, I've got two doors. I've got double doors to keep out the sound and the kids and still they get through. <laughs> well, you can't stop an ambitious child, you know? <laughs> no, and you, I've, I've learned to just, uh, roll with try it. To, try to love it. And, yeah. Because someday there will be no kids knocking on the door, and I'll be I'll miss that. You'll be sad, yeah. <laughs> well, thanks for coming on the show, and and I love to just kind of tell the audience how we got connected um, before we dive into the the podcast. Because I think these these tools and tips are really valuable for listeners. Because entrepreneurs are out there just hustling away, trying to figure out how they can make it on their own, and 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 how they can how people like us get connected. And so, um, believe it or not, I was looking through iTunes at some of the top podcasts that were out there and uh, noticed iTunes, Josh's not show. not Spotify? Yeah, yes, not Spotify. I was on, I was on a, Apple Podcasts is what they <laughs> call it. Apple Podcasts <laughs> is the, what we're supposed to say. Yes, Apple Podcasts. And uh, I read the bio and I was like, wow, this sounds like a really cool show. And so then I did, started doing some research. I couldn't find Josh anywhere. Uh, so I was like, let me, sh let me see if I can hit him up on Instagram. And so I shot, shot him a message on Instagram and I think you replied back like, uh, yeah, it sounds cool. As long as I can show up in my underwear or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was banking on you not telling that story. Oh uh, yeah. And I said, that's okay. Usually I record with no underwear on, so it'll be a great <laughs> show. <laughs> yeah. So I just wanted to make sure you were fun. <laughs> yeah. So, so for the listeners out there, if you guys are trying to reach somebody that you want to connect with, uh, to create a, either a podcast or, you know, whatever business venture or whatever it may be, um, don't rule out Instagram or any of those other mediums, uh, that you might think you need a professional introduction with. Cause today we're, we're so connected and it's really, um, easier to get connected, uh, with people like Josh and other awesome entrepreneurs out there. So, so thanks for being open to that, Josh. And, sure. uh, <laughs> We, I, I want to know, like your show is really great. And of course, you know, it reminds for people that don't know the pitch, it's similar to the shark tank, but on uh, a podcast and, um, and it, it's got some really amazing entrepreneurs coming on there, pitching people where, where did this, well, first off, uh, when did it start Josh and where'd you get the idea for yeah, it? Yeah. So the original version of the show started in 2015, um, there was an investor uh, named Chiel Manat who had reached out to me uh, because of another podcast I was doing that wasn't going anywhere. Um, and uh, of course, he didn't know that, but he's like, hey, I love the show you're doing, but I've had this idea to create a podcast that's like Shark Tank, but without all the bullshit that's on Shark Tank. Am I? Am I yeah, it's fine. It's fine. Tone fine. it down a little bit. <laughs> Sorry. Um, without all the BS, you know, like I want like the the real stories of how entrepreneurs get funded are nothing like what you see on Shark Tank. And, you know, there are millions of young entrepreneurs who are being led astray by what they're seeing on this show. And I think that there's, we could easily do something better in, in podcast form. And I was like, heck yeah, 
you know, <laughs> unbeknownst to him, my other show wasn't doing too well, so I was on board. <laughs> so it wasn't actually my idea, although to be honest, I had actually spoken with a couple entrepreneur or a couple different people who thought it would be cool if I did a show like that. So I don't know what it is about me that other people thought I should do a show like Shark Tank, but um, I don't know, maybe the universe wanted me to do it or something. <laughs> um, <laughs> what was the original podcast that you did? It was a show called The Daily Hunt. I think I took it down. It wasn't It wasn't that good. Uh, but it was about, like, if you've ever uh, used the website producthunt.com. Yeah. So I would try to interview the maker of the product uh, that day, like the maker of the winning product on Product Hunt that day and try to drop an interview like that evening. Nice. So the turnaround of trying to put together a daily show and like get the interview guests to like respond to me and you know because some, sometimes it'd be like one or two in the afternoon the number one product isn't responding to me or you know the entrepreneur behind it and so then next thing you know I'm um, going down the list you know option number two option number three and then I'm getting desperate and uh, um, then I found out that people weren't listening the same day anyway and I was like okay we'll forget it <laughs> <laughs> why, why am I busting my yeah so uh, well you also had some businesses going before even that is that correct mm -hmm. i heart repair is that it yeah so i heart repair um it's kind of a long and winding story but i'll give you just the the brief synopsis uh, i started it in college as a project uh because i wanted to write a shorter senior paper and the cool thing was i got to pitch it to investors like the the way the dean of this school worked is he wanted to bring in uh, uh investors from the community so he did we pitched the idea and then we had to turn a profit if we raised money from these investors we had to turn a profit in three months uh which is a crazy cycle to try to take money and, and actually um you know uh get a return on it in that short of of time um but that kind of like it was enough to make me go oh you know entrepreneurship is tough um, but kind of cool. This was fun. You know, I learned some stuff with it. But then immediately graduated from school, went straight into the workforce, worked for a year, um, and it was a bad company. Things were going down anyway. Um, and so then I got laid off. Um, the company went under a couple months after that. But um, suddenly I'm, I'm, I'm laid off, but I've got this like business I was doing on the side, which was the one I had started in school. Um, and that was what eventually became iHeart Repair, which was a ship-in repair company. So if you've ever seen some of these you know, websites online that are like, hey, we'll repair your Apple devices or your Samsung devices, um, just ship them to us and, and we'll send them back. Uh, that's, we, were, we were one of those companies uh, for, for a couple of years until I uh, got out of it. And was this overlapping the time when you started your first podcast? No. So what happened is I sold the company in 2014 and... Then I had sort of an existential crisis of who am I? <laughs> what am I doing with my life? You know, the, the money was in the bank. So like I had kind of the funding to try out my next thing. I knew enough about my last business to know what I didn't like about it and that I wanted to build something different the next time. I wanted to build something that I wouldn't want to sell in three or four years, something that I would want to hold on to and keep doing for the rest of my life. And so then I stumbled on this podcast called Startup, which was Alex Bloomberg, which chronic chronicled him starting the company, Gimlet, uh, which if you know the end of this story, I now work at Gimlet um, and the company got bought by Spotify uh, earlier this year. And so I start listening to this podcast, Startup, and it just blows my mind because I didn't grow up listening to, pu listening to public radio. And in fact, my first podcast I listened to, I think was like, an entrepreneurship show called like Pat Flynn or something. Oh like, yeah. Um, Pat, smart, you know, smart, Flynn, passive income, yeah. smart, passive income. Anyway. Um, so I was doing stuff online. And so that, that podcast was really helpful to me um, back in the day. And so then when I listened to startup, I was like, it just blew my mind at the, the quality and the storytelling and the craft and the way they introduced music in. And just like, you felt like you were in Alex Bloomberg's shoes starting this company. And it was so relatable and so compelling and it's wild how many podcasts or businesses have started because that show was so monumental to so many people. So, you know, I'm nothing special by, uh, by, by the fact that I, you know, that was impactful to me. But that kind of set me on a course where I started to get more interested in podcasts. And I was really bad. I was really horrible. Like, you'd think I'd be able to copy, you know, 
copy startup, but uh, I, I did it very poorly for a very long time. Um, and then I would say it wasn't until late 2016, early 2017, I finally figured some stuff out. So this would have been three years after listening to startup and two years of, of um, trying and failing in podcasts um, before I finally kind of figured some stuff <laughs> out. So. What, what do you think that that shift was for you, Josh? Because I, I see so many people getting into podcasts and having that a very similar process, myself included. So I'm curious, you know, what what do you think that why don't why do you think you couldn't do that when you first started out? And what do you think that that whole shift was for you? I mean, I think it it uh, if you've ever, ever heard the phrase, you know, ready, fire, aim or yeah. in reverse, ready, <laughs> ready. Yeah. I mean, that like that was the like I started podcasts because it was like, oh, I can spend 70 bucks on a microphone, sit down and record and publish an episode that day. My first show, I had a dream about it, thought it would be cool and then had published my first episode that day. So like m for me, it's all about just taking action and then figuring you know stuff out later. And I think that at least in this industry, it would have been helpful for me to have a little bit of experience and, and learn from some other people who understood the craft. And to me, like what I learned was that it's the process to create good, well-crafted stories. And it's the rigors of the editorial process that create the end result. And I had no process. I just sat down in front of the mic, <laughs> hit record, and then published, you know, I, I tried to do a little, little editing, you know, it's, you know, cut out some ums and ahs for my guests. But other than that, there was no real crafting of the story or even interview skills. I mean, I, <laughs> I had none. And so it wasn't till late 2016 when I just, we had had this incredible recording event um, because the, you know, I don't know if you know this, but there were 55 episodes of the show that we did from 2015 to 2016 that nobody ever got investment on the show. Oh, and wow. it was because every time we talked to an investor and tried to get them to make a decision on the spot, they were always very wishy. If I were to invest, I would want blah, 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 X, Y, and Z. And it's like, well, you know, you're here now, make a decision. Like, why, why are we <laughs> punting on this? Like, I want, I want to like, let's, let's, let's make this happen. And so finally we stumbled on a couple investors who were like, yes, I will make a decision on your show in an hour. And, and then we did this big recording event. We had, you know, I think over a million dollars committed to the companies, the 12 companies we had at that recording event. And we, you know, me and my wife, she she really helped in the early days of the show and still helps with it now. We just stepped back and we're like, holy crap, what do we do? Like, this is incredible. This is leagues better than anything we've ever recorded. But we, I started to realize at this point, I was like, I'm not that good at this. I need to reach out and get help. And so that's when we started reaching out to, you know, people I admired, you know, in, in radio. Um, uh, the, the Rob Rosenthal with the with Transom, uh, Alex Bloomberg, Matt Lieber at Gimlet, and you know as many people as I could reach out to and say, hey, I have this amazing tape, but I don't know what to do with it. I don't know how to turn it into a good story. What do I do next? You know, and some of them were helpful, others were were not. But uh, eventually, got introduced to a couple different people, and I'd if I could narrow it down to one thing. I mean, it's a lot of things. Like it's the true answer is it's everything cumulative, all the small things. Um, are, are the secret, right? But one thing that was just major breakthrough was having an editor. Someone, not someone who like cuts together the, the tape and like edits the audio, but an actual editor who looks at the story and, and the words and the narration and, and the flow and where things are dragging and says, you know, and looks at the big picture. Because when you're creating something, you get so into the weeds and so personal with with the audio, the interview, the person you spoke with, you know, like you get so into it, you, you, you lose perspective. And I think listeners, when listening to something like that, where the host or the interview has gotten so lost in the weeds, they don't know where you're going. They don't understand. They don't, they don't see the big picture. So having an editor who can step back and say, yeah, that was wonderful that you asked these 10 questions, but it doesn't work for the story. You're gonna have to cut it all <laughs> and go back and ask these questions instead. And that's the hard truth that I think I needed to hear. Um, and that kind of set us on a process of, you know, at that point, then we started hiring producers and, and that's eventually what led us to, to Gimlet. Where did you find your first editor then? So I actually found her in the credits of another show I was listening to. 
um, the Millennial Podcast. I think it's just called the Millennial or Millennial. Anyway, Megan Tan, she did this podcast chronicling what it's like to be in your 20s trying to figure out life. Um, and yeah, she, in the credits, referenced this editor, Devin Taylor, and I reached out and she's like, yeah, I'm available to take on some some new work, some new clients. And so uh, we started working together and fast forward four or five months, Gimlet offered to buy the show. And then Devin actually works full time at Gimlet now. She's a she's a full time editor. Nice. So. When when you started the pitch, Josh, what was the idea? To, did you have a Did you want to monetize it as soon as possible? Did you want to grow it into a, a thing? <laughs> what was your What was I your plan? <laughs> I didn't want to monetize it, but I I had to. Yeah. Um. You want to know something funny? So my first podcast ever that that Daily Hunt uh, podcast, we got our first sponsor. And they sponsored the podcast for $50 an episode. $50 an episode. That's a start, man. That's a good start. <laughs> no, I know. But I, it's just hilarious to look back and think, oh, my gosh. How did I ever think that that was going to turn into a business? Um, you know, I probably should have quit. But I didn't. And uh, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> what was your, for the pitch, your original plan? Were you, were you planning to monetize it? Did you want to grow it first and then and then uh, create a business out of it? What were your thoughts? I mean, I just wanted to create something that I liked. I wanted to create something that was compelling to me. And to be honest, you know, after creating the 55 episodes that didn't have any investment on it, I felt like something had to change. I was getting sick of my own show. And, you know, and I think not like not settling for what it was, but saying this can be better. We're going to push for more, you know. And at that point, I had done enough sponsorship deals here and there to know and seen other podcasts do this to know that it was possible to get a sponsor to buy into an entire season ahead of time. And so that's what I did. Um, I had several people starting to reach out um, who wanted to sponsor the show. And I pitched them on this new season that we were going to do where there's going to be real investment happening. And uh, um, we found one sponsor to sponsor both ad slots on all 12 episodes. And that gave us the money that we needed to rent a studio, to um, pay the editors and producers. And, you know, it was actually not enough money. We ended up spending it all um, to make the show. But, you know, you live and learn. And that's, I mean, that, I guess maybe it was my business background before that that gave me a little bit of a sense for for deal making and, and, and things like that. But yeah, I mean, I wasn't that that great at it. I worked with a couple different people. There's this guy named Glenn, um, I'm forgetting his last name, that was writing the book on podcast sponsorship. I worked a lot with him. He helped me get some uh, sponsors for the show, but also just kind of trained me on how to sell my own ads. And so that was how we got this first sponsor for the show. First big sponsor. That was my next question. So when you're when you're a fresh podcaster looking uh, to monetize it and looking for sponsors, you mentioned Glenn had a book, but what are uh, and maybe you can reference that book. But what are some ways that people could uh, look for sponsorships if they have a new show or if they've had an old show and they're they're ready to start monetizing it? Yeah, sure. So the gentleman's name is Glenn Rubenstein with Adopter Media. And uh, he's got a book, I think it's just called Podcast Advertising Works. Uh, you can buy it on Amazon. If you have a show that even has a little bit of an audience that's gaining a little bit of traction, you'll start to get, you know, there are podcast charts where people can find you because advertiser, advertisers are obviously looking for shows to, to sponsor. Um, the other option is Midroll Media, which I'm sure you're familiar with. I don't know if they take on new clients, but we got big enough at, I think, 10 or 12,000 listeners per episode, um, big enough to, to get, to grab their attention. And, uh, I think those were some of the first ads we had on the show, um, back in 2015, 2016, they had pretty low rates. I think it was their CPMs were something like $43 per million, um, impressions. And it was kind of the bare minimum for the industry. And then they would take 30% of that, I think. And so it just taught me that very quickly, if I wanted to make decent money on this thing, I needed to start uh, um, signing my own deals with sponsors. 
And so that's when, you know, I think we started finding other sponsors who were more specific to our listener, um, people who wanted to reach entrepreneurs, who were building tools for entrepreneurs, um, things like that, um, where, you know, once we got in with them, they were more interested in paying more to reach our audience than, you know, an audience that's listening to Comedy Bang Bang or something like that. Um, There's something really specific and valuable about those people that were listening to our show that that advertiser um, was interested in. And still to this day, we have some of the highest, you know, advertising rates in the in the industry um, because entrepreneurs, you know, who are trying to build businesses are, are very valuable to a lot of companies. So, yeah, uh, that's that's been really helpful. So you're talking about having 55 episodes uh, with no investment. Was that the first 55? Yeah, that was the first 55. That I, I would imagine most people would get frustrated and quit by then. So I'm curious, what uh, what kept you going? I remember having the same conversation with my wife over and over again, maybe once or twice a month or once or twice a week, where I would just say, is the pitch the thing? Is it really the thing? Or is it the thing that's going to lead to the thing, right? Because leading up to this point, you know, getting let, let, uh, laid off from my job, you know, was like the thing that got me to go full time into this fledgling business that I've been working on part time. And then the first podcast I started let, didn't go anywhere, but it led to the pitch. And so it was always a question of like, is this the thing or is it just going to lead us to the next thing? And, and, you know, because my mind as an entrepreneur is always going with new with new things. And so it was always a question of like, should we ditch this and start something else? How do we know when this thing's not going anywhere, you know? I mean, we were spending down the money that we'd made from the sale of our first company. The business, you know, even at ten or 12,000 um, listeners per episode, it was not enough <laughs> to sustain our family. <laughs> It was scary. I was just always questioning like whether I was doing a good job providing for my family and whether I needed to suck it up and like should I start like waiting tables in the evening so that we're not spending down our savings like that just felt so foolish and like I was being unwise and and perhaps I was, but my wife was always on board and encouraging and every time I was like yes, I think I should just pack it up. She'd be like, "No, I feel like this is the thing." You're going to figure it out. I'm just like, <laughs> who are you? Where did I get you from? I mean, I just, I always felt like I was failing her. And she was the one who was saying, you're not failing me. Keep going. And that was just what I needed. That was just enough to to keep going. Yeah. And she was along the journey. I mean, she helped, um, you know, the big recording event, the big one where we had the over a million dollars of investment that was the thing that you know, led us to Gimlet ultimately, she was the planner behind that. She was the person running the event, making it go off without a hitch, um, her backgrounds in, in wedding planning. So like she was key. She was clutch in more ways than just, you know, encouraging me when I was down. Yeah, that's the story. How cool. That's a perfect example of surrounding yourself with good partners mm -hmm. uh, in business and Gotta life, have them. right? What was the first company that uh, you got investment for? Um, I think the first one was a company called Teamable, and it's a it's a recruiting tool for companies to basically enable their employees to refer friends. There's an incentive if a friend of yours gets hired at the company that you work at, and they just like create this automated process where you can you know log in via Teamable and it'll look at your social graph, your friends on LinkedIn and whatnot, and just say, hey, would you like to invite this person to come work at your company and whatnot? And so that pitch did really well on the show and I think was one of the the capstone moments from those first 12 episodes. And honestly, that was the episode that we led with when I sent an email to Matt Lieber under the headline, Amazing Tape, <laughs> um, and then something about the podcast like Shark Tank. Uh, he listened and loved it. And that is how we got our foot in the door at Gimlet. Can you share how much that investment was? I think it was $350,000 from Jillian Manis with Structure Capital. There may have been another investor or two. Um, I can't remember. Um, but since the show, I believe they've gone on to invest over a million dollars in the company. It's uh, one of the success stories so far. What was it like for you and your wife when you finally realized that they were going to accept the investment and it was episode 56 and or 55 or when you, when you realized it was all going to go through? 
I see. Okay, so you're talking about. All right, so I think. I mean, we. I remember sitting there, <laughs> and just freaking the hell. I mean, we had just never had investment happen on the show, right? And I, I freaked out. I mean, I was just like, I threw my hands up in the air. I looked over her. I was like, what? Did what just happen? Oh my gosh! You know, and we're like, <laughs> we're zooming in on this old like CRT monitor at this really rinky dink studio in uh, um, uh, in San Francisco in the in the Tenderloin, and it was. I mean, this place was wild. Oh, yeah. It was like a Ripley's Believe It or Not. There were like um, pendants everywhere for no reason, and then like double headed calves you know skeletons of of like <laughs> frogs and calves and animals it was wild anyway so yeah. that's that's the picture you know it's just it was a really i guess an old studio i don't know but yeah it was a very formative moment for the show it was cool well so so this led you guys to the point where i guess you had some contacts with Gimlet and Gimlet reached out and then talked about possibly buying the show is that right yeah i mean i had reached out to matt lieber and alex bloomberg years prior um cold just cold emails and never got anything from alex but matt uh did take a little bit of interest so um i guess i wrote a decent enough cold email to to get a uh, a response uh his response of course was sounds awesome let me know when you have something you know let me know when you're far enough along where you can send me some tape of, of what this thing sounds like. Uh, he, of course, didn't want to hear the raw, you know, recording, which if, if he had, I probably would have sent it to him. Um, but um, it was enough to make me go, OK, maybe there's something here. I should invest in it, hire the right people and, and build this thing up. I mean, building a creative business is weird, though, because it's just it just doesn't scale. <laughs> and the things <laughs> yeah. that make it work are so not scalable. <laughs> Right. It's. I mean, the only thing that is scalable about podcasts is that uh, it costs the same amount of money for a hundred million people to listen to the show as it does to have ten people listen to the show. Um, you know, it's just the hosting costs. But the process of making it and making it really well does not scale well. Yeah, it's interesting when when you think about creative businesses, whether it's podcasts or books or um, you know art or, or or whatever it may be. Um, there's a lot of work that goes into it that's, you know, people don't understand. And there's, there's, you've probably heard this old story where, um, you know, there was a painter and he painted something for a city for, uh, 15 minutes and charged him $2 million to do it. And they, they said, are you ridiculous? You know, is this ridiculous? 15 minutes of work for $2 million. And the painter was like, well, it's been, I spent 30 years to get to this point working on my craft and trade, yeah. you know? Um, and I know there's a lot of creatives out there that um, feel undervalued because a lot of times there's headbutting between um, businesses or clients that say, you know, you didn't work long enough, you didn't put enough hours in on this. And the creatives are like, well, you know, this this creative genius takes a lot of, you know, <laughs> I had to meditate mm -hmm. for three days to get to this point. And then I spent, <laughs> you know, and in three weeks walking around in a forest to figure out that I wanted this, you know? <laughs> and, um, yeah, so it's interesting to see, but it's great when we can bring this to light because things like podcasts, you're right. You know, uh, the input cost for, um, you know, a show that has, 10 downloads compared to a hundred million downloads many times other than that creative thought that goes into it. So, yeah. I mean, the thing I keep going back to, even, even as the show has grown and scaled with Gimlet media to a place that is just awesome. And it feels so blessed. I still go back to every day. Am I making something that I like and I enjoy? And I think, you know, there's something to be said for knowing your customer and researching them and, and living in it. Um, but there's also just something to be said for making something that you actually like. When you sit down and you listen to the thing at the end or you read the thing that you wrote, are you happy with it? Is it good enough? And if it's not, go back to the drawing board, you know? And I know some people say, well, you just got to hit publish. And I agree that at some point you, it's never going to be good enough and you do have to hit publish. Um, but I think staying true, this sounds really corny, but staying true to yourself and, and, and what interests you is in the long run, if you're create, if you're making a creative product that's meant to, you know, help or entertain or inspire 
does it help entertain and inspire you? And if if not, go back to the drawing board. Yeah, you have to. Then and there's a delicate line between being too over analytical about your own stuff and like hitting a publish button. Um, sure. So it's, that's why deadlines it, are so key. Yeah. <laughs> Do as much as you can within the confines yeah. of your schedule. Yeah. Uh, when was it that Gimlet acquired your your show, the pitch? February of 2017. So okay. two two and a half years ago. What's been a difference for you, um, being a part of Gimlet as 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 opposed to prior? Oh man, what hasn't been different? I mean, the the like obvious thing is we have a team working on the show, um, and I'm not signing their checks, which is great. Um, we also have, you know, a dedicated ad side of the business, Gimlet Creative, that spends all their time selling, you know, these these big clients and, you know, selling these multi-million dollar advertising deals. And I basically get to show up, you know, with a producer and there's the script or here's the, you know, a little bit of banter that we get to do during the ad and I get to record. And then I step back and, and get to spend the rest of my time, 95% of it, on the behind of the scenes stuff that it takes to make this show happen. And that's amazing. I mean, to be an artist who gets to make art and, and full time gets to spend most of his time doing that. I mean, I, that's amazing. And that was the vision of Alex Bloomberg when he created uh, Gimlet is he wanted to enable a whole generation of uh, podcasters to be able to, you know, make what they wanted to make. And he felt like the traditional structures weren't, very open to new people trying out new things and kind of pushing the the medium forward so still to be selected and to get that opportunity is just is just mind-boggling um but there are so many things that are different from the team to uh how we grow to you know some of the things that i can't do anymore um that 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 kind of frustrate me at times because I'm a part of a really large organization now that uh, Gimlet is owned by Spotify. I mean, I kind of made a, a decision in my career early on that I did not want to work at a big Fortune 500 company. <laughs> I wanted to work at a small business where I could own more and and progress faster rather than working at a really large business where I had to invest 10 or 20 years and you know and of my career and and hope to move slowly up the up the ladder. And uh, that just wasn't enticing to me. I did a, a little bit of it in my interning at different companies um, when, I, when I was in college and enough to know that I didn't want to do that. So to be here now at a very large publicly traded company is surreal in a, in a weird way. <laughs> um, but, but it's, you know, of all the companies that I could work for, uh, Spotify is, uh, is a great one. So. And in these days, Josh, are, is Gimlet providing the investors and the guests, or you still have a hand in reaching out and finding those people too? Our team is responsible for for most everything. Um, so very involved in the casting process and, and of building the show. In, in no means has that been passed off. And, and perhaps for good reason that it appears that way, that, you know, once you become a Gimlet show, that then, you know, the... The, the great minds that, that are there will come in and tell you what show, you know, how you need to make your show better. And uh, there really wasn't it, and which was which really clashed with my expectations. They really say, you know, you get in, they're like, this is great. What you've done so far is great. What can you do to make it better? And, you know, I'm sitting there going, you tell me, what can we do to make it better? And, uh, you know, they're really there to let you continue to have ownership over the thing. There isn't a lot of you know, so there are so many times in our internal Slack, people are like, hey, what's our policy on X, Y and Z? Because there, there's no policy docs for for how to make shows, really. Um, it's, you know, every team has a different way of doing it. And we have the autonomy to build the show and make the show how we want. We, of course, have the resources of the editors and the you know really smart people there um, to draw from from when we need it. But for the most part, we we work on our own. It's uh, me, two producers on the show, an engineer, uh, and an editor. And in those early days, Josh, um, what? Uh, how were you finding your your investors and your guests? A lot of credit goes to Shiel Manat. Uh, so he was that investor that reached out to me in the very early days and said, um, "I think your voice sounds great. Let's start a podcast like Shark Tank." And I said, "Oh, well, thanks. Let's do this." And uh, you know, he was in Silicon Valley. I'm based in Sarasota, Florida, and he had a network out there. He'd built and sold a couple companies, 
And so he kind of introduced me to his network. And of course, you know, that was the 55 episodes that we did that didn't get investment. Um, but it allowed me to build a few relationships with other VCs there. Uh, namely, one in particular is this gentleman by the name of uh, Jake Chapman, who was the first you know, investor to say, hey, why don't you have investments happen on the spot on the show? And I said, hey, will you do that? Because that's been the whole point of us. And, you know, that's what I've wanted to build in the first place. And so he was the first person to say, I can do that and I'll help you find the rest. Uh, the other people who will, you know, make a deci decision in an hour. So it, it just kind of grew from there. Now my network is still decent. Um, not anything like it would be if I lived in Silicon Valley. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm always trading up, trying to, you know, use work with the people and relationships we've built now to, to, to find the next investors for the show, um, the next entrepreneurs and all that. So it's, it's very much a game of, of relationships. It really is. What do you see? Where do you see the show going in the next five years or so? Um, that's a good question. You know, I think when we step back, I see the show growing a lot and, and hopefully, you know, I'd like to do more things with our community. I think the fault of podcasting is that you you push. It. I feel like sometimes I'm in a cave in you know with very little access to the outside world, and I hit publish, and then all of these people put on their headphones and listen, but then I never hear the conversation come back. Right? You'll hear a little bit of stuff on Twitter and and Instagram and, and things like that. And, but it comes in in, in in bits and pieces. And I'd like to do more things where we're able to directly engage with our audience and talk with them. Uh, we're doing a call-in show in, uh, well, who knows when this episode's going live, so I won't name a date, but a couple weeks from now where I'll get the chance to hear a bunch of people who listen to the show call in and, and give their pitches. And so that'll be really cool. Um, but I think going deeper there's just a lot of people out there trying trying and struggling to build their businesses and they don't you know they get a lot of bad advice from people they don't have the family structures to really support them and and tell them what's smart and what's what's not smart and so they end up you know learning by making a lot of mistakes and i think to a certain extent you can't avoid that um but i also think that there's so much more we can do to really dive deeper into the problems that these people are, are, are facing. Um, and there's so many different ones. Uh, so that's the challenge is always trying to figure out which ones are the problems that people have the most, um, you know, are, are the biggest issues for the most people. But, um, you know, I, I want to do more fun stuff like that and, and connecting with our audience. Um, I think that would be cool. What do you think that, um, podcasters actually this is a good question other than the pitch what are what are a few of your favorite podcasts um a, a, a great podcast i'm sure most people have probably heard of it is how i built this they just do a really great job of uh you know diving into these people who've built businesses and you know telling their stories another random one that i really like it's short stories it's um the way i heard it with mike rowe have you listened to that show at all I've I've heard about it. I've never listened to it. Though. His style and the, and the reveal at every at the end of every episode, um, he takes lots of creative liberties in in you know reading between the lines of of you know great stories in history. Uh, but his takes are always uh, so entertaining and and so thought provoking. You often have to go back and listen to the episodes again, which isn't a problem because they're so short. Because once you find out in the end who the person was that he's been talking about that whole time, you're like, oh, that changes how I see the story. I need to go back and re-listen. Um, so that's a, that's a great one that uh, I don't think gets mentioned too often. I, that's good. I like those lesser known podcasts that people really like They're, that'll, that, you know, really stand out, mm -hmm. uh, because eventually those are going to become, you know, more well known, but, uh, it's fun to, to hear those in the early days. What, what do you think are some of the things that regarding podcasting today, some of the things that a lot of podcasters are missing? <sighs> Um, the biggest problem with, I think, and the reason I know this is the biggest problem, because every step of the way, whether I'm working with independent podcasters or podcasts at Gimlet, everybody's trying to figure out how to break through the noise and, and, and get traction, natural, organic growth on their show. And 
you know, I, you know, some people blame the discoverability problem. Um, you know, it's Apple Podcasts' fault for not doing a great job of recognizing, you know, new shows or, or whoever's fault. But I think it's just the nature of the medium because it's so private. It's not like TV shows that you watch with people, although we do have some people listen to the show with their families. You know, there's a majority of the time people are listening while they're working out. It's very much a internal private thing. And uh, it's funny, you know, I know a lot of people too will screenshot, you know, the podcast that they listen to, but there's also... Um, the podcasts that they won't tell anybody that they listen to, you know, whether it's, you know, somebody on the extreme left or, or right of the political spectrum that they secretly, you know, whose views they don't they don't mind and they enjoy listening to. But they wouldn't want the world knowing it to, you know, um, I don't know, some erotic podcast or something like that. Um, there, There's enough of that. So. So it's, it's like the way people listen to podcasts, I think, makes it not as shareable as, as we would like. And there's lots of tools out there where people are trying to make podcasts more shareable, but none of them have hit that critical mass where it's like, wow, this is really blowing up and changing, you know, changing things for my show. And so, you know, I think it really comes down to like in the early days, creating kind of a... a this, you know, this podcast episode is meant to build relationships with X, Y, and Z or to get leads for, for this thing or my course or my book or, you know, to, like it's all about kind of leveraging the show to like do other things, which is hard in the beginning because you're just trying to create art that you're proud of, but you kind of feel like you have to do some of these other things to make ends meet. Of course, you don't have to worry about this if you're building your podcast on the side, which I think is great. But at the same time, for me, I wasn't building the podcast on the side. I was doing it full time for a couple of years, spending down my savings, but it forced me to be really brutally honest about how how good was the show really? Because it's it's weird. People don't, you know, if they don't like your show, <laughs> they aren't going to tell you. They're just never going to play it again. So getting that brutally honest feedback is just so rare and so hard which is why I think maybe for me it's been so valuable to sit down and say, do I really like the thing I've created? Is that, is it good enough? And to constantly be in that cycle. Um, I'm trying to, you know, kind of impress myself in a way every, every episode, try to do something I've never done before. But that doesn't really answer your question because how do you, you know, the, the big question of how do you cut through the noise is just going to be so unique and so different for, for everybody, depending on the type of show you're building, depending on the type of people that you're trying to connect with, you know, is, is the podcast a part of a broader mission or is it the thing like it was for me? Yeah. I mean, there's, I have lots of ideas and like general rules, but it's, it's really specific to each person's type of thing that they're building and what they're, what they're wanting to accomplish with it. Yeah, I find that true as well. If you were talking to other podcasters, and I know that now you're working with, with, with Gimlet, it may be a bit, bit different for you, but looking back on things, where is the balance for for podcasters out there between, um, of course, you know, we mentioned many times recommending creating a great show that you're really proud of, yeah. but also, um, I wouldn't say playing the the algorithm systems that are out there like you know i apple has the its apple own charts. little game yeah and then now uh spotify is definitely in it and mm -hmm. and you've got all the apps that are out there if, if somebody's creating a show they want to grow it obviously um but they also want to you know create something really good content where's where's that that balance for that you would recommend others to to do i think the thing that if I could do this with every episode, I think it would be it would it would make a drastic difference um, in the show. But in an ideal world, you sit down with an idea of a of an episode you want to create. You start talking to the people that you need to to create the episode. Maybe it's one person, maybe it's ten, depending on the type of story you're telling. Um, and along the way, as you're talking to people and you're starting to see what the story is you start to kind of look for other podcasts or other media outlets or other news organizations that like you could partner with on this piece of content who might be able to take a piece of it or a theme of it or a quote from it to create their own piece of content, right? Um, that 
drives ad revenue for them or makes their job easier. In an ideal world, every episode I create would also be possible that that episode would go down a feed of another podcast, another podcast that I, you know, think is good and is worth working with. And there's th this constant collaborate. Like, that would be am amazing because, like, every episode would just grow from, from each episode to the next and your, your audience would just keep growing. You know, in reality, I end up working with other podcasters, you know, one out of every 50 episodes. And, and that's that... Um, that that's not necessarily how it should be, right? Because then I'm just relying on, oh, did the pitch get promoted across the Gimlet network this month? Are we getting our 30 second, you know, um, promo swaps? Are they happening with other podcasters? And like those are small levers to pull, and they're they're important levers. Um, but what are the really big, juicy, fat levers we can pull that'll just be a game changer and, and double and triple our audience? And in the world of podcasts, that is working with other podcasts that already have audiences. And so how do you do that systematically? I don't know. There's a couple people trying to solve it um, for smaller independent producers, getting them to band together and promote um, their shows. Don't ask me to name it. It's just one tool that I've seen across uh, in the past couple months. I can probably look it up later if that's important. But there... <sighs> If 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 we if I could figure out how to do that with some other shows that are at our level in a way that was uh, easy and systematic, that'd be amazing. But the truth is, like most things in the creative world, it's not easy or systematic. It just you know requires the work and the very human touch of reaching out to different people and seeing if they're willing to connect. So, um, kind of trying to figure that out now. But it's funny because I feel like I've been trying to figure that out for uh, the past two years now, even after joining Gimlet. So it's easy and appealing to look for the, the hacks, you know, or the, the things that are really going to take it to the yeah. next level, but it's, you still got to maintain the long game, you know, I think the people that can take advantage of those hacks most often are people that have been in the long game and they're no, they know, and they're ready yeah. and they're prepared, um, for those when they come around and then they double down on it when yeah. they see it. There's not much program. I mean, even the going advice of like, Hey, rate our show on iTunes, it will, you know, it helps us go up the charts. I, I think pretty recently Apple's come out and said, no, it doesn't actually help your ranking in the charts. <laughs> the rankings are basically, are, are, you know, based off of different things than the ratings and how quickly new ratings are coming in. So even that is, it, but people still do that all the time and say, it'll, it'll help us grow our audience. But yeah, it, it's interesting to see because even on the top of in Apple rankings that, you know, uh, you can look at the top podcasts and some of them have a hundred reviews and some of them has 6,000 right. reviews. And so and some of those like, ones with 6,000 are all fake. How do you know who to trust in this world? <laughs> exactly. They're all five star, 6,000 five star reviews. It's, it's, I know. Uh, and then you have great podcasts with like a hundred uh, reviews and you're like, what's the deal here? Mm hmm. Yeah. What, what's Spotify doing nowadays? I, you know, I'm, I'm on Spotify, but I don't follow it all the time. But so, but you know more yeah. about that. Podcast playlists are a thing which could be could be exciting for people. I see a lot of potential there because then you know users can create their own podcast playlists. So then perhaps the these are the ten podcasts I'm listening to right now list becomes a playlist that they then you know link to and and that could be really helpful because you could in one fell swoop subscribe to all of the podcasts that are recommended in this playlist or or, or you know something like that rather than going through in the blog post, manually clicking through to each podcast in Apple Podcasts or Spotify or wherever, or, you know, clicking the embedded, if you're lucky, they've embedded the playlist on it. Anyway, so that's one thing that I think is super cool. Also, they're, of course, trying to figure out the algorithmic way to recommend podcasts. Uh, right now, it's pretty rudimentary. It's like, you know, if the word Bitcoin is in your podcast title, you're going to uh, get recommended other podcasts talking about Bitcoin. But there's no sense for quality or how have past people who've listened to that, right? Because like Spotify has all this data of like listen through rates and all of this stuff. So they can tell if a podcast episode is like truly outstanding for a publisher. Um, have you signed into podcaster or what's it called? Podcasts.spotify.com, that tool that lets you see your audience and like how long they're engaging yeah, in each of your yeah, episodes. Yeah. Like there's so much they could do with that data to cr make their recommendations better. Um, and they will. It's just, you know, a matter of time when you're a, a big tech company. Yeah, it, takes a while. it seems like and I'm sure uh, you've felt this, too. But 
the podcasting uh, world is goes slow as far as like not not the actual podcasters but the technology but yes exactly yeah uh, any any thoughts on that huh um yeah that's an interesting one i wonder how much of it is because like it's almost like you have well apple had the majority of the Right. You know, podcasts for so long and still do really. Yeah. And they're only just now with their new focus on becoming a services company because revenue is declining in their hardware. So they had to figure out how to make more money. So now they're rolling out services, right? With Apple, it's not called Apple TV, but Apple, Apple TV plus or whatever that thing is. And then their game subscription and then, uh, their mag news subscription, you know, like they're just trying to make money, you know, via services now. Um, which is a very different game than what they've played in the past. And I have lots of, you know, reservations about how well they're going to be, they're going to do that. Um, but I do think that that could be a good thing for podcasts. You know, if Apple continues to have such, you know, such a decent market share, at least in the U.S., if we're talking U.S. specifically, you know, it could have an the, an impact on the entire industry if they kind of moved the RSS feed protocol forward and maybe introduced other, you know, things where you could um, link to different parts of the episode or create, you know, I guess they do do stuff like that, but nobody does it. Nobody uses it. I don't know. There's, it doesn't seem like they're changing the underlying technology a lot, but I think if they just did something simple like making it so that people could create paid podcast episodes or paid subscriptions to a podcast you know where this is a paid podcast and if you want to subscribe and listen you gotta pay you know like they could very easily turn that on and in an instant the industry's changed because i can think of a lot of podcasts that have a small very passionate niche of listeners and ads just are not cutting it and so they're sending all their people to patreon and then people are subscribing on you know, paying for their content and supporting them on Patreon, but then they have to go back to Apple Podcasts to listen to their free content. And then maybe they still have to listen to ads there because, again, these podcasters are trying to make ends meet. And that's just not a great experience. You know, why, why shouldn't there be a paid version where they can listen and there's no ads, right? And you can pick which shows you want to pay for and which ones you don't, you know? And of course, there's other people that, that believe this as well in the industry and there's other startups trying to, to do this. But if Apple were to turn it on, it could be a real game changer for the industry, but uh, who knows? I, I think that they're starting to care about podcasts within Apple now that Spotify is caring about podcasts, but yeah. We'll and see. I hear, I hear Google's trying to make some moves too, but, um, Oh, are they? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Like yes. big moves are so, just like, we're updating our app. No, they're trying to make some big moves. So I, I have a friend who spoke with somebody who was high up in Google and, um, they want to start, uh, search when you do a search in Google, say you talk about growing a podcast on Apple, it will go to like uh, 57 minutes and 46 seconds. Josh and Chris talk about on the oh, business yeah. method podcast, how to grow. So they're, they're trying to do something. That's just what I hear. Maybe it's yeah. uh, rumors, but that would be great too. And that would kind of help podcast get some movement as well. Yeah, it would for sure. Could you imagine that? How cool that would be if, like, you know, they talk about I want to hear somebody about somebody investing in this business or how so and so got his investment money, and they did it on the pitch, uh -huh, uh -huh. and and they search on Google, and then boom, it says the exact time um, that, and then you can just hit the play button on Google instead of reading fantastic. through an article. That would be awesome. Yep. Yes. So if you're listening, Google and Apple do that <laughs> totally and you know yeah. i think what's exciting about the industry too even from an ad perspective is i think we're going to an industry in which apple is selling ads apple and spotify are, are selling big advertisers and 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 fulfilling ad spots on hundreds of thousands of podcasts at once you know they become the mid-roll media where you just designate where you want ads in your show and you click a button I mean, just like on YouTube, right? You say, hey, here, here put a mid-roll ad on my YouTube video, right? Like, it should be that easy on publish, and it should be the platforms that are doing this. Obviously, you're still going to make more, more money if you go out and do deals on your own, but for those just starting out and want to make a little bit of money, the solutions right now are so ad hoc, and it's crazy to me that I know everybody's saying podcasts are early, but it's just crazy to me that 
we don't have the basics of advertising on different platforms where you can just turn it on with the click of a, click of a button like you can on YouTube. That's just crazy to me. How in the, the maturity of podcast in the long run, how early do you think we still are? Are we still in like the wild, wild west days? As <laughs> Are we still in the wild, wild west days? No, I think we're out of the wild, wild west days. We're in a maturing industry phase. Industrial right? revolution, maybe. Yeah. yeah, totally. Where people are finally waking up and saying, you know, when you have brands are like, we should start making a podcast, you know that, you know, it's uh, the, li- the life, it's advanced to a little, to another stage. Over these uh, episodes, the, over this series, Josh, we talk a lot to many different influencers from around the world Mm -hmm. about how they grow their influence and how they handle that responsibly. So I just like to shift a little bit and and talk about influence. Mm -hmm. Um, You've done an amazing job growing your pocket. I mean, I think that's incredible that you just had 55 episodes that had no investments and you kept going, Uh, but you know, still connecting with these amazing entrepreneurs and investors. And then, and then you had the shift where, you know, start somebody got their first investment and then Gimlet came along and uh, acquired you guys and now Spotify about Gimlet. And so at becoming an influencer over this time, what do you feel that responsibility is to you and, and how do you manage it on a regular basis? You know, to be honest, I don't think that much about it. Um, sometimes I sit down and go, hey, why don't I have more followers? <laughs> well, you know, and I don't, maybe I should spend more attention on my Instagram and post some more selfies. You know, I'm not very self-absorbed. I care more about the art and the work, um, which means I should be doing a better job promoting the art and the work, you know. But at the same time, then there's a voice in the back of my head that's like, well, you know, people are following you because they want to see something funny or, you know, the pictures of you. They don't really care about what you do for work. They already know about your podcast and they're probably already subscribed. And so I go I go back and forth on it. Um, you know, I think in the beginning, I really cared a lot about becoming an influencer. I wanted to be someone who was notable and important. But the more I've thought about it and the more, I, you know, when I see people that I admire um, that are older in life and, and they're happy, you know, they don't really talk or care about the people that, that look up to them as, as an influencer. Right. And the people that have the most influence kind of don't give a shit what people think. And so, you know, m- maybe that means I need to be posting more stuff about how I don't give a shit what people, think. <laughs> you know, I, you know and, but at the same time, I, I guess I give enough of a shit to, to not, say that because I'm, you know, still a little bit concerned about what people will think. And, uh, I don't know because personally too, I just, you know, I don't find much value in spending lots of time on Instagram or Twitter or, or any of the social networks, you know, and, and what's grown my career and my influence actually happens over inbox, you know, over my email or DMing people, right. To, to build a bridge and have a conversation and connect with somebody who's, who already has a more influence than I do. Right. And that, you know, that's just, they're just stepping stones from one thing to the next, you know, I'm leveraging where I'm at today to go to the next thing. Or if you don't like using the word leverage, you could say I'm using it as as a stepping stone stone to go to the next thing, you know, but like just doing the best I can with the tools that I have at my disposal now, but always pushing for what's next. What's strange to me was, is that it was easier for me to do this as an entrepreneur because everything fell on me. If it wasn't a success, it was because of something I wasn't doing. And now being a part of a bigger team and a much larger organization, my show may fail based entirely on not me, <laughs> on a you know a poor decision made in 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 marketing or a lack of marketing or some you know executive decision high up that you know we don't care about business anymore we care about true crime or something like that and i i can't do anything about that and so in some ways i don't control my destiny as much but i it kind of doesn't matter cuz i can't change those things so all i can do is focus on what i can change what relationships i do have and how can i push forward build the next bridge to, to connect with someone to me, I guess it's more about the one-on-one relationships with people. And if that begats greater influence on my Twitter or Instagram, 
That's great. Um, but perhaps you're talking about influence in a very different way, and I'm getting caught up in the social media aspect of it. So um, maybe I need some clarification there. Well, it, you know, it, it, it comes in so many different forms. So the influence that one has as uh, working one-on-one -on -one with people can be very influential, you know, because there's, there's yeah. people, there's major influencers in our world that nobody has ever heard their name before. But they're making decisions um, that affect uh, a lot of people around the world. And yeah. as, as an entrepreneur, um, sometimes we have that because there's a lot of entrepreneurs that don't want their names out there. They just want to do their business, um, create their create their art and yeah. uh, and make things happen so so uh, but then of course there are the social media influencers that, that that use that and sometimes abuse that i think like you mentioned this too i think in an email um before you came on the show that you really do have the desire to be a person of influence um in someone who's that's well regarded and, and most of us do but uh, influence just gets thrown around and it gets a bad reputation like the used yeah. car salesman, you know? I want to be well regarded in my community, right? Um, but it's strange building a business where my community is, is really disparate. You know, I've got people listening in, um, I don't know, how many countries around the world? Um, a lot of countries around the world and, and they all have similar interests and like we would probably get along if we ever met in one room, right? But will those people be at my funeral? Probably not. Will they even know, you know, that I'm dead uh, years down the line? I, whereas the people in my local community that are here in this city that I don't connect with because I'm working remotely on a show that gets distributed across the world, you know, what am I missing out on there? You know, those are the people that could actually come to my, and, and not that it's all about the funeral, but I think to me, that's like the very concrete measurement of like how impactful, how meaningful were you in people's lives? You know, I think of my father-in-law and I know he's going to have a probably <laughs> a thousand or two thousand people show up, you know, uh, on that day because he just has had su such an impact on people's lives when they've, uh, you know, when they've needed the help along the way. He's there for them. And... Uh, I don't know. It, it, that's hard because I feel like the things I'm creating really good art that I'm proud of. And that possibly means that I will be a, a person of influence for hundreds of thousands of people that I will never meet. I mean, that that is exactly what it means. And that is important. And that's good. I just wish, but there's not that satisfaction of knowing here's a person that I helped up in their time of need, right? I lent a hand like that. Those are the things that are going to be satisfying at the, you know, end of days at the end of days at the end of our lives here so that's i don't know that's that that's what i think about hopefully someday i'll be a kind person that cares about the community <laughs> hopefully someday <laughs> that, that's what i'm working on yeah so hopefully i can do both hopefully i can help a lot of people um who will never meet me in person and also help the people that are close by do you have anything that you do or use any any types of programs or conferences or events or thing or books or uh, courses that you use to continually grow on a regular basis because the reason I ask this is because like each week what I do is I visualize myself on my deathbed 95 years old and looking back on my life and the things that I did and the people that I oh, influenced. Wow. We're both obsessed with death. Great. Yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> I think it, it was not an obsession with obsession with death, but an obsession of life and how to be yeah, as impactful yeah. as possible right? uh, while we can. But anything that that you use on a regular basis to continually grow that helps keep you going. Um, no, I'm not much of a tools or hacks or systems guy in my in my personal life. I you know I think we're I focus a lot on building systems for for my for my team so that the team can run efficiently. I should probably work on some some systems for myself, uh, including my own health. But uh, I, you know, I just kind of try to take every day as it comes and and do my best work. And you know, I think I can probably level up in, in that area over time. But I think that the simplicity of that, of waking up, doing my best work today, and at the end of the day, looking back and saying, "Did I put everything into my work? Did I put everything into?" my relationship with my kids and my family, you know, um, for me, I'm pretty torn between professional development and, and 
just being there for my kids, you know? I've got three kids that in, uh, let's see, in 20 years, they'll be gone and it'll just be me and my wife. And and that scares me, you know? So I, I wake up trying to balance these things that are really hard to balance. Like you, it feels like sometimes I can't have both, but I try to have both. And so when I'm at work, I try to do my best work. And when I'm with my family, I try to, to be the best dad I can be. Um, but I don't have any systems or processes or hacks. I'm okay. sorry. No, that's I mean, okay. I probably do have them if you were to really look through my, my habit. I just don't know they're there. Um, maybe because they're so, so habitual. But um, I wake up and drink coffee. <laughs> I wake up and make breakfast. <laughs> yeah. You know, I try to stop for lunch. That seems like an important thing. I try to stop working at a reasonable time and not work in the evenings so that I can give my brain a rest. Um, I've uh, come pretty close to mental exhaustion and burnout several times, and so I'm constantly kind of on the the ragged edge of that and trying to be be smart. But what do you do when you hit that point? Try to change something. It's hard because um, this is going back to the being a creative person. I, I'm just so detail oriented and obsessed about the details and making things sound perfect, which I think is what is great about the show, but it's like a curse, it feels like. Because how do you impart that level of perfection onto someone who's not a perfectionist? I've got a team full of people who are not, they are not perfectionists to the level that I am. They do good work, but they're not obsessed with like, is there a 0.1 second pause here or a 0.2 second pause here? And is this music precisely what we need in this part of the episode? Or is this word the right word? Or should I use a slightly different word? You know, like that's the kind of thing that is, I mean, they all kind of obsess over different parts of it. So, so I shouldn't, shouldn't say that, but nobody gets as obsessed about every single part of it as I do. And that is just fundamentally not scalable. Um, and I've heard other, you know, really great podcasters that, that are that look at their work as art that struggle with the same thing and so i don't know what this looks like you know am i going to be 70 years old still you know working on the show and uh putting you know fine-tuned notes in on every you know mp3 that i listen to for the for the show until they go live you know am i, am I still the guy that's like no this title's not good let's we can do a better title for the episode you know um probably not so i'm gonna have to figure out how to offload some of that um but i don't know where i'm at where i'm at right now i'm not i haven't done that and i don't know why but i don't, I, I think it's because i've tried in, in little tiny ways and felt every time that i needed to there's certain things that only i can do as the person whose name is on this thing publicly um yeah and, and maybe that's a flaw but that's where i'm at it's all part of the process, right? All part of the process. <laughs> Where are we going anyway? <laughs> yeah. Um, Josh, I just want to ask you a couple more things to wrap things up. Sure. If if you wanted to give um, a couple tips on managing influence to the listeners uh, as a podcaster, what would you say? I th think it's really, really just, it's really important to poll your audience um, and, and not just from a here, come fill out this survey uh, perspective, although that's great too. That was really valuable when we did that. But also just a get on the phone and talk to the people listening to the show and get a feel for what their, what's their daily life like. You know, what, why do they listen to your show? Why are they, ex what are they, what are their challenges in life? What are their problems? Where do they, what's their status? What are they trying to get to, you know? And having that person in your mind as you're creating an episode um, as you're deciding who to bring, what guests to bring on, like that's, um, I'm always, I'm always reminded of that. And, and, you know, when I said earlier, like I need to connect more with the community, I'm kind of preaching at myself here in a way, like I need to do more of that, need to know my community better. Cause while it is really great to make something that I like and I like, and I care about, I haven't been an entrepreneur since I sold, you know, the pitch to, to Gimlet two years ago. I still think of myself as an entrepreneur, but I'm not having to, you know, do all the things that entrepreneurs do on a daily basis. I'm able to put my head down and focus on the one thing, the show. So I don't, I'm not always as in touch as I want to be. 
And so I need to create a process, a systematic way of connecting with people. No, I'm just kidding. It doesn't need to be a process. <laughs> but, um, you know, just spending time talking to people, hearing what, what their wants, needs, desires are, and uh, making sure that everything I create is tapped into that those needs if uh the listeners want to reach out and learn more about what you guys have going on where's the best place they could do that at um sure i mean i think you can find me on twitter at josh muccio or instagram or shoot me an email i'm at josh at gimletmedia.com no spam please and um yeah happy to to chat about you know different things in this episode that were confusing or i left uh left short I'm happy to connect with people uh, afterwards. Definitely check out the pitch, you guys. It's a great show. Oh, my gosh, yes. Um, check out the show. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I had to put a pitch in for the pitch. Um, Josh, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for sharing all your tips and tricks and your wisdom with us and your story with us. Real, we really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. It's It's been a blast. And listeners, thank you guys for tuning in once again, and we'll see you all on the next episode. Goodbye, everybody. Hey, listeners, thanks for joining us once again. We wanted to remind you about our high-performance productivity coaching and our five, six, seven, and eight-figure private masterminds. These are all designed for entrepreneurs by entrepreneurs to help you scale rapidly and grow. Check out all the details at thebusinessmethod.com. That's thebusinessmethod.com. And... We'll see you all on the next episode.